Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer. Today, we're chatting about the importance of chambers of commerce and strengthening and supporting local businesses with special guests. David Brown, President and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber. Jonathan Weinhagen, President and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. And Roy Williams, President and CEO of the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. So thank you all for joining us. It's just so great to have you here to talk about the business of business. It's part of uh, the fabric of America. And I'm going to go uh, over to you, David, in in Nebraska first. Uh, I just wanted to to set you up with the fact that uh, central to the nature of our country is the right to establish profitable, productive businesses. And we have roughly 4,000 chambers of commerce to advocate for a huge array of business interests, including uh, my own. Uh, as as a service provider to uh, the nonprofit sector. And you're dealing with a whole range of different issues. So we're going to actually talk about the texture of those issues and uh, and try to uh, have you inform us on on exactly the nature of your chamber and and, uh, your membership. So uh, David, could you give us uh, your uh, uh, view from your perch in Omaha? in terms of how these organizations function and what their service is to the civil society in and around Nebraska. Sure, uh, Mark, first, thanks for uh, having me on. I, I appreciate it. It's good to see Jonathan and Roy on the program. Uh, Roy, you're overdressed, so we'll, we'll, we'll let that go at this point. Um, we've already been kidding Roy about that, so <clears throat> it's not new. Um, you know, I think chambers of commerce, particularly the, the larger ones across the country, uh, are really in the community building business. In, in large measure, we're asked to deal with things we have no authority to deal with, uh, which means we have to figure out a way to partner with those organizations that do have the authority to deal with, with issues. So we, we find ourselves here in Omaha, as an example, we have about 75 different organizations outside the chamber uh, that we partner with to solve issues, everything across the board from issues dealing with people, issues dealing with place, issues dealing with the economy, business climate, infrastructure, et cetera. I'm just trying to make this a better place for everybody to live, work, and play. So um, chambers have this really innate sense of ability to, to convene different parties um, to do so, and some, sometimes very visibly, uh, sometimes from behind the scenes. But ultimately, if the chambers are engaged like we are in doing both the economic development activity as well as kind of traditional chamber public policy, community development, talent development, all those kinds of initiatives, plus membership services, um, then you're able to really take a big picture of what the community of the region looks like and then dive in in those places where the business community can have a significant impact to help solve problems. So I think uh, our chamber certainly does that in this region, and I'm sure Jonathan and Roy have similar um, responsibilities where they are. And uh, Jonathan, you're you're really about uh, helping people to prosper, right? You you provide an information clearinghouse. You provide a way to exchange um, uh, uh, experiences uh, with each other. You help people uh, uh, remove problems. Um, how do you ensure that you are keeping your uh, your finger on the pulse of what different businesses need because you don't, you have manufacturers, you have service providers, you have um, restaurants, you have all sorts of different organizations with different interests. How do you ensure that you're able to balance services across these different sectors? 100%, Mark. We remind people every day, particularly on the public policy front, that the business community is not a monolith. Um, we have, you know, solopreneurs all the way up to Fortune 500 companies and everything in between. And it's a constant feedback loop. Um, every single day I start my, my morning making phone calls, uh, talking to folks, understanding what their challenges are. You see some consistent themes across industries. You see some, some consistent themes across size of employer. But then there are some really nuanced differences. And as we've gone through this pandemic, um, we've seen that, I think, in a, in a very heightened way. Uh, so it's, I would tell you it's more of a you know, kind of an art than a science with regards to how we do that work. Um, but it's what you know, guys like David and Roy and I are, um, are charged to do every day. And you know, to your point, to make the region prosper. And, you know, uh, Roy, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about Oklahoma, um, you have you have a very unique economy. 
And then you look at the various interests. Oklahoma has this phenomenal history of, of uh, exploration and extraction of natural resource, but you also have this great asset of sunshine with the coming solar age of, of energy production. You have these interests here that are um, that are actually complementary. They can solve problems in different ways. How do you uh, how do you ensure that you're dealing with Oklahoma's current um, uh, uh, industry um, uh, configuration and and ensuring that you're preparing the way also for the future in concert with your citizenry, your your business community in ways that that people can embrace, cooperate, and get things done. Uh, yeah, well, just like Jonathan and, and David said, you know, you have to be extremely collaborative. We obviously have a membership and we've got 4,000 corporate members. We're constantly surveying them to understand what their issues are and what their needs are. But we also uh, contract with city government, county government uh, to look at bigger picture issues other than just, you know, member services. So, you know, we're constantly looking out there over the horizon to see, how do we continue to diversify the economy? How do we continue to grow new uh, entrepreneurs, new businesses? Uh, and also look at what are community initiatives that need to be addressed. We find oftentimes when, our, when something comes up, whether it's you know diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it's criminal justice, uh, whether it's talent recruitment, that oftentimes we look around the room and we're the only entity around who really has the resources and the ability to address these issues. And we don't necessarily want to hold on to those for a long time, but until someone or some entity adopts them, you know, we sort of think, well, we better do it because it's really important. Um, so, you know, it's constantly understanding how, how things are changing, where the winds are blowing, et cetera. And speaking of that, we're also a, a big wind energy state too. Uh, but, We've done a phenomenal job over the last couple of decades of diversifying the economy. So those particular entities are not, you know, the only uh, economic development legs of our of our stool. See, I, th I think that that's just so, uh, so amazing. The points that you're making, because what you're what you're really talking about is grappling with the idea of prosperity and uh, uh, the idea of prosperity for a really broad base of folks. Right. The diversity, equity, inclusion piece is so important to actual prosperity, so that prosperity is not restricted to a subset of Americans. Uh, could you talk a little bit about those programs that you have that would not normally be viewed as being associated with a business organization like the Chamber, and, and how that connects to the business interests of your folks? Sure. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we have a membership base as well as just a business base that um, is, is really cognizant of that, but no structured initiatives to deal with it. So the chamber over two years ago partnered with the Urban League here in Oklahoma City uh, to do just that, to put on education seminars, uh, to help counsel people, to help put best practices in front of people, et cetera, uh, so that uh, they could pursue whatever portion of diversity diversity, equity, and inclusion that they wanted to. Uh, another example was we were having really issues in our local criminal justice system. And our, our leadership said, you know, somebody's got to tackle this. No one's in charge of a criminal justice system. There's many, many players. None of them talk to each other. And we decided, well, maybe the chamber can convene those people, get them talking to each other and make some progress and, and chip away at uh, high incarceration and, and all of those things. It's also led now to a talent strategy. Um, and so we were able to convene all the players who impact the criminal justice system, uh, make them aware of the problems and the unintended consequences of their actions, which every time one of them decided to do something, it impacted someone else. And so, you know, it's, it's a full-time job for us now. We have full-time staff working on it. So hey, Mark, I, Mark, I might jump in real quick. You, know, you said something that struck a chord with me and maybe with David and Roy, and that's you know, things that wouldn't typically be associated with a chamber. 
I think the, the last two years, if they've taught us anything, is that nothing's typical anymore. But even before that, with regards to the business community, we saw the business roundtable nationally change the definition of you know, the, the, the purpose of a business from shareholder primacy to benefiting all stakeholders. There's been this tremendous evolution with regards to the role that businesses play in social issues and, and far beyond just that, that core uh, role of creating jobs and creating opportunity and creating profits. I mean, I think that's something that we're all wrestling with. You know, we're, we're, we're in the middle of, the, uh, of a poll, uh, David, I'm, I'm going to go to you. In the, we're in the middle of the poll, and we asked whether people uh, felt favorably to, toward members, um, uh, toward businesses that are members of the chamber versus businesses that are not. And we had about uh, uh, almost a 70% uh, view that people who were engaged with chambers, businesses that were engaged with, with chambers received a more favorable uh, uh, rating. Maybe this is part of the reason. David, I'm sorry to cut you off. You know, Mark, I think it's a perfect segue in my comments anyway. I think you know the communities are looking for leadership. And uh, sometimes they, there is nobody to jump into the gap. And so you, you try and find those organizations that have the confidence of the, the public as well as our members uh, to engage in things that, as Roy said, sometimes might not be a long-term agenda for us, just an opportunity to, to, to get something geared up, uh, clearly have an agenda and a strategy in place, make sure it's got funding long-term, spin it off so it can do its community thing, and then we do it again. And, and I think you'll, you'll see chambers across the country do that in specific issues that rely upon their individual communities. Uh, the DEI space, as you mentioned earlier, hit us all in a major way over the last several years. We were fortunate that in 2017, we had worked with the United Way and the Urban League to come up with a 2040 vision for Omaha. And one of the key things we realized there was that the demographics of our population was gonna change dramatically over the next 20 years. And we needed to make sure that we were ready for that. And so from businesses to nonprofits, to foundations, uh, philanthropic groups, everybody worked together to develop a strategy that said, how are we going to make sure that we're uh, gonna be taking advantage of this a much more of a diversification of our population. Two years later, who would have thought that we would have this, this scenario you know, presented to us that said the business community wants to be more engaged uh, in being a, a someone who can help solve the problem of DEI. And all of our employers need to be better about hiring diverse employees and having inclusive culture. So um, we created a group called CEOs for Code back in 2018, Code being our commitment to diversity equity. And that group was already in place and ready to go in the, the summer of last year when civil rights became a major issue that was in the landscape in our community and many other communities. So sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, I think. But, but, but in the end, you know, the chamber just stepped into that fray when we needed to. And we've been perceived as the leader in that. But we also know we were not going to be the leader forever in that space. But businesses will always have a role to play. You know, you're all pointing out something that is so important to the American character, the idea of, of going into the place where we're insecure and learning from others who have information that we don't necessarily have and then sharing that. It's sort of the nature of a chamber. If you're engaging others, you're exposing yourself to, to new information. And Jonathan, before we got on, you were talking about this kind of unique, crazy idea of the chamber functioning as a way to to have dialogue across political parties. Oh my God, what a, what, what a concept. Could you just describe this kind of the unique situation that you face and how you help bring, um, bring parties together in a very, you know, we all hear about divisions, divisions, divisions. Well, maybe we're not as divided as we think. Jonathan, could you, could you just sort of give us a rundown of what you were beginning to talk about before the show? Absolutely, Mark. You know, civil discourse, um, I would tell you, is at an all-time high and almost toxic. Um, if you, you know, track the national media, you know, here in Minnesota, we have the only divided legislature in the country where our um, House of Representatives is, you know, majority Democrats, um, the Senate is Republicans, the, the executive and the governor um, is a Democrat. So, like, by design, um, every single day, we are charged to to create public policy, unlike any other state in the union, um, in a way that brings people together. Um, and it's hard work, but it's the hard work that we should be doing. Um, it's the hard work of a divided nation. And I would argue that we're better off for it. Our pandemic response has been better. You know, today, our biennial budget forecast came out, $7.7 .7 billion 
surplus that you know will now have the I'm going to call it opportunity because I'm a, a silver lining glass half full kind of guy. Um, the opportunity will be to think about how do we invest that, whether it's through you know tax rebates or you know increased services or probably a combination of those two things. As I've talked to leaders of all of the parties in the last 24 hours. So, um, so we're doing that hard work. And I think, you know, to David and Roy's points earlier, um, it's a really unique role that the business community increasingly plays um, in major markets across the country as a little bit of a con convener and, you know, adult in the room when it comes to some of these really meaty and challenging public policy issues. Yeah, I, I find that that's also true, right? When I go to uh, liberal states and, and I hear conservatives say, you know, the liberals are our enemies and, and you go to conservative state, uh, states and you hear the liberals say, the conservative, I mean, it's all nonsense, right? I mean, Roy, when you're, when you're solving problems, do you really care? Conservative, liberal, aren't you, aren't you trying to just sort of fix things and make things better? Absolutely. You know, the, when you start... Uh, negotiating over morality and personal opinion as opposed to, you know, this is an economic issue uh, as opposed to a social issue. Here's the consequences of the kinds of decisions you're making. Um, you know, it changes the dialogue and, and you can, you can get people to communicate around uh, those kinds of subjects as opposed to whether it's guns or, you know, things like that. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, bit. you know, give a little, give a little, get a little, you know, it's, a, it's that right. kind of a thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. It, it's got to be win-win. It can't be win-lose. So, so, you think about it, Mark, you know, chambers are built that way. I mean, if you think about what a sign curve looks like, all of our membership, um, all of our chambers I've ever seen, you have some folks at the far left and some folks at the far right politically, but the vast majority of our members are congregated somewhere left or right or right down the middle politically. And, and right these days, you could drive a Mack truck through that wide open middle because everyone seems to be polarizing so much of politics that it's given chambers this great opportunity to have an acknowledgement that we're homogenizing issues a little bit, meaning that we're, we're not going to be so far left and so far right that we're going to be chasing people away, but we'll be generating consensus in the middle. And it's in that middle where you get stuff done. And so whether it's Jonathan having to work with a, a D house and, a, and our Senate or us in a um, a, a non-partisan um, legislature with only one house. We have the Senate. That's all we got, the only one in the country. Um, or the variety of different people that Roy's got to work with and across the structures in, in Oklahoma. You know, we're, we're still in the process of trying to get people to do things. And you, mo you mostly don't do that by, by pushing and shoving at either end. You do it by pushing and shoving in the middle, getting enough people around that consensus issue. And that's what Chambers are good at. We've shown we can do that work. Um, and frankly, it, it, if, if you're not doing that kind of work, you're probably not getting as much done. Plus, you find that if you if, if you treat others with disrespect, if you if you beat them up, eventually what goes around comes around, right? Because power shifts and all of a sudden you become the person that doesn't get any consideration from the person that you didn't consider previously. I mean, it's just like in a family, you know, if I'm if I'm rude to to my brother, my brother's going to be rude to me. So Maybe we should just be a little bit more considerate and, give, and cut each other some slack. We just uh, did a, an interesting poll in which we, we asked whether uh, chambers of commerce organizations most support the interests of either big business, smaller businesses, or all businesses equally. And we got 38% uh, saying big business, 50% saying um, uh, small businesses, and and 13% uh, say uh, talk about all equally. How do you balance here? given scale, right? Because scale very often um, uh, uh, correlates to influence and, and funds and so on. So Roy, how do you ensure that, you know, if you take a look at your, I think you said 4,000 members, did you say? Right. Take a look at your 4,000 members. I'm sure that very, they're very few um, and the wealthiest are the largest businesses. And then you have a huge mass of, of smaller businesses. How do you ensure that you keep your organization balanced so that you're serving all 4,000 members and even in welcoming new members who are not currently um, but uh, part of the chamber, but you would hope to join. Yeah, I, you know, it, it is a balancing act, but 90% of our members are small businesses. And, and fortunately, the leaders of the larger businesses understand the importance of small business and the small business issues, because at one time they were all small too. You, you never start out big. 
And, and so, that, you know, there's that understanding that we have to create a place that is conducive to, to everyone succeeding, not just, you know, the big people or the little people. So constantly being aware of that, uh, continually surveying, continually talking uh, with them, continually engaging them in issues. Because, yeah, I mean, everybody's got different issues and different priorities. But we've been able to really get leadership together to look at the community as a whole. And if we don't build a great community, it doesn't matter whether we support big businesses or small businesses. It's not going to work. And so, you know, getting everybody to kind of check their hat at the gate when they walk into the room and say, look, let's look, let, let's do what's right for this community in building a quality place, as Dave said, to live, work and play, as opposed to building a place that is just good for certain kinds of businesses. Jonathan, when you take a look at, at um, the uh, country writ large and the function of business here in this time when coronavirus is changing a lot of ways in which we interact with each other. We have uh, uh, the coming AI, we have the technology and uh, revolution, social media, um, we have the change in energy um, requirements, uh, climate change, all these different aspects. Do you think that the, that the chambers can be functioning in a, in a different way that um, moves um, slightly uh, that, that evolves its traditional sort of business lobbying work. Roy mentioned a whole range of social issues that uh, the greater Oklahoma uh, City Chamber is, is really driving in collaboration with a lot of others. Is this something that, that chambers really ought to uh, think about um, in terms of sort of the good of the nation and, and how that those kinds of programs that Roy mentioned connects to our overarching prosperity? And if so, how do we function differently going into the future? Well, not only do I think we can and ought to, I think we have a responsibility to, um, as, as civic entities, to lean into this work. Um, and it is a little bit awkward. And I remind my board regularly that if you're uncomfortable, we're probably doing this right, um, because we're you know digging into and leaning into issues that we haven't traditionally led with. You know, you know, taxes and regulations have always been a piece of the public policy agenda, but today, you know, um, inequity becomes an emerging piece. For us here in Minneapolis, public safety and policing. Um, we just, you know, as an organization worked to help defeat a ballot measure that would have eliminated our, our department of police, eliminated our police department. Um, that doesn't mean that we think that everything's going great. You know, what happened to George Floyd at 38th in Chicago in the heart of our city uh, should never have happened. Um, it's something we could have predicted because it's happened time and time and time again. Uh, so we need to we need to lean into these issues, and we are as a business community. I think it gets back to that changing you know reality for business leaders that our responsibility is beyond profits. Um, it is to contribute in different ways, and I think the business community has always done that over the arc of time. But the expectation um, is maybe changing even a little bit faster than some of our organizations. And um, you know, grateful to be alongside guys like David and Roy who are, are leaning into this work as well. I know we're gonna talk a little bit about criminal justice reform. I mean, these are the, the big issues that connect to the core work of our organizations. You know, that's, it, it, it's so interesting. David, do you also see that that prosperity requires a certain um, foundational set of values that, that it is in, in this era um, for the chamber to get involved in, um, in your corner of the world? Absolutely. I, I think there's a, a role for uh, change agents in communities. I mean, Roy has heard me talk a lot about catalytic leadership over the past several years as we worked on the ACCE board together. Um, you know, and that's about telling your board, telling your community, your employees, particularly your new employees, so they know what kind of environment they're getting into. Guess what? If you don't like change, this isn't the place to work because we challenge you every single day to go out and make something better. And some of those things are things we have no expertise engaging in. And so we've got to learn how to do it. We've got to bring the right people to the table. We've got to collaborate. We've got to push and shove and try and make sure the issue gets out there. And if you're really not doing that as a chamber, there's really only excuses. One is you're, you're small enough that you just can't do all the things that a medium size or a larger chamber can do. Get that. Um, but, but if you have any of the resources and you're worried about things in your community, you need to be engaged in leadership and causing chambers to get into those things that we might not have historically 
then engaged it that are in but that are unique to your community that need to be fixed. So in our in our case, the 2040 vision process identified a whole bunch of those issues that we need to start leading on that in the past somebody else might have been leading on, but just not effectively. So we find ourselves constantly in that space. How do we look over the next five year hill? What's coming at us that we need to be paying attention to now so that we're not hit in the face with it five years from now when it becomes a great big issue. And that chambers, I think, are really good at doing that. Um, I, I'm going to stay with you, David, go to Jonathan, and we're going to end up with Roy because we're coming to the end of our time. I, I, I'd love to to uh, get your view as to how uh, the the board staffs and, and members um, ought to evolve in, in these organizations. We've spent some time talking with Black Chambers of Commerce um, created because uh, African-American uh, business and business leaders uh, were very frequently omitted from chambers, we talked with um, with uh, Native American uh, business groups. We talked with um, in Los Angeles um, the first Latina who leads a uh, a chamber of commerce. Um, how are you evolving your organizations to deal with some of the issues so that you internal to your organization, as Roy was talking about, now having having a staff to deal with exiting from incarceration, those that you have the expertise to to understand the needs of the entire community, the diverse community, men, women, different ages, uh, different stages in business, uh, different ethnicities, and so on? Well, I think you start by inviting everybody under the tent. Anybody that's got any kind of input that could give, give you some insight into a community issue or a challenge or somebody who's been dealing with those issues, uh, there's no reason to keep anybody in the dark. Just come on in and tell us what's going on so that we're we're really looking at these issues from all the different perspectives. And then you need to have representation of all those communities, I think, on your board, representations of all those communities on your staff. Um, and even in the organizations that you then participate in as chamber execs, we get invited to serve on countless boards and committees, and task forces, and strategy efforts, et cetera. All of those groups that we're involved in should also be held accountable to be, to reflect what their community looks like. Um, and not only what it looks like, but what it will look like. Our, our, our case in point is interesting. I mentioned to you earlier, the demographics of our communities, we're about 25% non-white today in our region. By 2040, we'll be more than 50% non-white. So just think about all the ramifications of that and how can you turn that into competitive advantage? And who do you have to bring to the table to make sure you're dealing with all those issues of culture and religion and infrastructure and housing and just fill in the blank? You got to bring a whole lot of different people to the table than you might have if all you were worrying about was networking events and maybe traditional economic development. I, I don't think we have the ability to do that any longer. We've got to be out there thinking about issues and bring as many people to the table as we can. Jonathan, how are you transforming yourself in, in Minneapolis? I would say everything David said and being mindful of time, I would just add you know, violent intentionality every single day. Violent intentionality. I love it. I love Whether it. Whether we're thinking about the board, we're thinking about our staff, we're thinking about you know, who we're engaging um, in conversations every single minute of every day. Um, that's what it's going to take. So I, I, I love that. I, I'm not sure that violent intentionality <laughs> would be a phrase I would coin, uh, Roy, but, but um, my sense is that you have the same kind of spirit behind what you're, what you're uh, intentionally doing. Absolutely. I really can't add anything to what these two guys said, you know, other than emphasizing we've got to reach way beyond our membership to really move the community forward. So, you know, in, engaging the right people and, and making sure we're looking at all aspects of our community and not just narrowly focusing. So I just echo what they said. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your your wisdom. Roy Williams, President and CEO of the Greater uh, Oklahoma City Chamber, David Brown, uh, President and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber, and Jonathan Weinhagen, President and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much. Thank your staffs. And, and thank you so much for informing us of the of the broad range of your programs. You're so important to American civil society. And, and we very much appreciate your sharing your work with us. Thank you, Mark. Take care, Jonathan, Roy. Have a <laughs>